Okay, we are ready. Everything is on set. So maybe without any further ado, maybe I would like to give the time for Dr. Mi, Dr. Nguyen for delivering the session for our visiting like professor for the material development. Okay. Right. Uh, Pro Dr. Nguyen, mind, are you ready? Yes. Do you mind oh. uh, letting me to co-host? Uh, oh, sure, sure. Thank you. I'm going to make you be a co-host. Yes. Okay, you are already a co-host. Thank you okay. so much. You're very welcome. Okay. It's working. This one down here. Um, slideshow. Okay. Um. All right. So. Um, so, um, in the last um, lecture, right, I'm going to talk about um, evaluating, selecting, and adapting materials for teaching English as an international language. Um, so, I'm going to start with some background on um, the world of Englishes. Um, I'm not really sure how much you have already known about that. Um, so, I'll just start with very general background on, you know, um, how English is used in different contexts around the world. Um, and then I'm going to talk about principles of English as an international materials development. And then maybe we have a little break. Um, we see how it goes, okay? And um, then come back um, and looking at some, um, some examples, okay, from textbook evaluation research, okay, into the question of to what extent materials you know, English language teaching materials prepare students to communicate with people from diverse lingual cultural backgrounds. Um, and then I'm going to present some evaluation checklists that you can use to design materials or to evaluate materials, okay, for teaching English as an international language. Right, so let's start with um, some very general background, okay, who are L2 uh, English learners and which varieties do they learn? So we know that English is a global language, right? Uh, no doubt, there's no doubt that it's a global language. Um, it's being learned and spoken all over the world, right? Um, and according to a report by the British Council, um, it is estimated that approximately 2 billion people, okay, currently speak or learn to speak English worldwide, right? The majority of these are second language speakers. Okay, so this vast number of second language speakers of English has made English the, the world's most commonly studied language. I think, um, can I can hear some some noise, some background noise? Can 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 you just mute? Oh, sorry. Yes, yes. Let me. Let sorry. Me mute it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. It's okay. It's okay. All right. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so um, it is a global language and one observable effect, right, of this widespread of English is that there is no single version of English used in the world. Uh, people just use English differently, right, in so many different ways throughout the world. Um, they sound differently, they use words differently, they have different ways of expressing their meanings, their intentions, uh, different resources um, to participate in interaction. Um, and they're not only American English and British English, but also Australian English, New Zealand English, Canadian English. Um, and these are only some varieties of English, right, among many others. So the term wall English is, is used to describe this diversity. Now, according to Kachru, I'm not really sure if you are familiar with uh, Kachru's work. According to Kachru, world Englishes can be divided into three categories. The inner circle, all right, um, including all Anglophone countries, 
where English is the mother tongue of the majority. So those countries are the UK, USA, um, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Ireland, um, and uh, the outer circle, okay? The outer circle, including countries which are formal um, colonies of uh, Britain or of the USA, right? And where, because of the historical link to the UK or the USA, English is used as an official language, right? So examples are countries such as Singapore, um, Bangladesh, India, Malaysia, uh, Pakistan, the Philippines, and so on. And then finally, we have the expanding circle, including all the remaining countries, okay, where English is learned as a school subject or as a foreign language. Um, okay, and uh, examples are countries such as um, Vietnam, China, Thailand, Indonesia, right? Okay, so how do people outside the inner circle, right, um, use English? And in what way, okay, um, the way that they use English may be different, right, from the inner circle um, uh, speakers. Now, we know that the outer circle countries have their own languages, right, long before English is introduced into the countries. Um, so, um, so after it, after its introduction, right, into the country, English is used alongside, okay, other local languages and serves a designated purpose in the community. <clears throat> um, so, for example, <clears throat> English is used as a mean of communication in the government, uh, administrations, uh, business and education, right, in, um, in, in Singapore, uh, as well as a lingua franca among different ethnic, um, ethnic uh, groups in Singapore as well. Um, and part of the populations, right, in the outer circle may also speak English at home. And then, and, and that means that their children may grow up acquiring English at the same time as another home language. Um, so if you think about this situation, right, it, it is totally different from the situation of inner circle monolingual countries where English is perhaps the only one recognized or national, right, the, the facto national language. So if you look at the picture here on the screen, right, it shows the linguistic landscape of a multilingual outer circle country. And I'll tell you where it is, right? It is, it is a sign in a construction site in Singapore, right? And you can see that this warning is given in four, lang four different languages. Uh, you have English at the top and then uh, Chinese Mandarin and then Tamil, and finally, uh, Malay, right? Um, so because of the contact, right, with the local languages, uh, English is said to have become localized in those countries, okay? Meaning the way that English is used in those countries can be very different from the way that English is used in the UK or in the USA, you know, in terms of, you know, their sounds, their, their intonation patterns, their sentence structures, words expression, um, so on and so forth. Um, so let me give you an example of how English or, or some localized features, right? So uh, of, uh, of English um, in, you know, some outer circle countries such as Singapore, Malaysia, and Hong Kong. Um, <clears throat> so um, a, a very typical example is, um, you know, speakers of those uh, varieties of English, right, tend to omit articles. So instead of saying there is an apple, they say there is apple, right? So omit the article. Um, the forms of quantifiers uh, are used quite differently from the way that English is used in, in the circle countries. So they say like amount of people instead of like a number of people. But I must um, say that, you know, I have observed an increasing number of native speakers saying amount of people, right? especially in online comments, when you look at, you know, how they comment on, um, you know, articles online, uh, they do say amount of people <laughs> increasingly. Okay, um, collective non cow nouns are used as cow nouns. Um, so for example, instead of saying furniture, right, people in Singapore, Malaysia, and Hong Kong tend to say furnitures, like plural, right? Or equipments or research researches instead of research, right? Research is non-count in you know inner circle variety. 
But in those varieties, the outer circle varieties, it is a count now. Okay, so you can count one research, two researches. Redundant preposition. Okay, so they tend to say discuss about instead of discuss or study about instead of study, for example. Um, there's also direct translation of idioms and pragmatic particles from local languages. Um, but, uh, you know, um, those features are more evident in spoken than in written language, uh, particularly in informal settings. Now, um, we should note that although, okay, uh, many of these features, okay, many of these localized features uh, would be considered an error if we use them in inner circle uh, context, right? Um, however, in the outer circle context, um, these features are accepted as de facto local norms, all right? Um, in Singapore, for example, um, the local variety of English, uh, which is Singlish, right? I think you have heard of it, right? Um, now, the, the government strongly opposes, right, Sing the use of Singlish because they consider it as a form of uh, bad English, poor English. Uh, however, it is widely accepted okay, among the people, and they consider Singlish as a group identity marker, which unites them together as Singaporeans. Um, so, um, and, and a deviation from the local norms may not always be welcomed, okay, as we will see in the next video. So I'm going to show you a video um, about how people react to Singaporeans speaking English with an Angmo accent. Angmo means Western, right? Uh, Anglo-American accent. Okay, so I'm going to share the sound. And let's see it. The smart local <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Fauzi and welcome to a brand new episode of One in the Street. In Singapore, English is a language that unites us all despite our different ethnic backgrounds. And yet when someone speaks the same language but in a different accent, we raise an eyebrow. So that's why I'm taking the streets to find out what Singaporeans really think about other Singaporeans who speak in a different accent. Alright, first question, are you both Singaporean? Yes. 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 Yep. Yes. I only speak English and I'm very comfortable with English. <laughs> Malay. English and Malay, so I rather speak Malay. Between the both of you, who do you think is a better speaker? Me. Me. Definitely me. No. <laughs> now I have a challenge for you, alright? I've got this paper with, with a sentence and I want you to read out the sentence, okay? I have an accent when I speak. 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 Do you think you have an accent when you speak English? No. <laughs> yes. So I have English accent. I mean, if you hear me speak in Japan or Korea, right, and I'm speaking like this, and I hear somebody speak like this, I'll know like directly they're Singaporean. Which is my next question. Do you think Singaporeans have a unique accent? I think Singapore accent is quite like sharp. Like, Da, 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 da. Like, oh, really? instead of like very like, uh, you know, yeah, the la la le, then you get the ya la. Definitely Singlish. Yeah. Now, can you demonstrate it? Do you judge people who have an Angmo accent? Um, it depends on like how they speak. Because sometimes you can tell if it's natural or it's those exaggerated types. Mm, mm. Uh, let's say halfway like in their teenage years, they decide like, okay lah, I want to speak with Angmo accent. And then, <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah, then it's like, you can tell it's exaggerated. La. For me, I don't think so. I think that um, it also depends on upbringing. Mm -hmm. Because some people, they are more English speaking and mm -hmm. probably have more Caucasian um, family members as well. Yes. Okay. Judge, okay, go ahead. Why? But because it sounds weird, it sounds like it's not them. They are trying to be someone else. Why do you think people judge other people for having a foreign or Angmo accent? Maybe it's because like the identity in Singapore is like this is your accent and like this is where you come from. So like why are you trying to be someone else? Like is Singapore not good enough for you, you know? It's the one and only Desiree. I guess when you look at someone, you really think, okay, I think they are like this. But when they are trying to act like they are not like this or like not this, and people feel a bit uncomfortable when you're just like not you. It makes them feel inferior, I guess, because, yeah, am I wrong? No, it makes sense, yeah, it makes sense, like, 
people who have who who speak properly are supposedly smarter. You know that kind of thing. So people don't really like it. Why do you think some Singaporeans speak in a foreign accent? Uh, maybe they are speaking to foreigners themselves. Okay. So you have to adapt to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are pretty adaptable people. <laughs> I will be harder to understand, like. If you say like oh siala or like eh bochi or all these like different lingos that we use, yeah. Like if I spoke to a Caucasian man, like my English would like suddenly be a lot more accentuated and right. like I will speak a lot more properly. But like if I spoke to an uncle, like if I'm ordering nasi lemak at some store, I would right. speak to him like more Singaporean-ish. Right. So I guess it's a matter of being understood in conversations. A lot of people talk about this term code switching. Me I, I think I will just um, I will just stop there. I just you know because um, yeah. But you, what the video shows you that you know a, a foreign accent, right? Um, an inner circle accent, a standard accent, right? May not always be accepted in the community because it uh, signals non-memberships, right, within the community. All right, so um, let's move on to the next part. Um, so, so we've talked about local features, right? How it, how English is used in the outer circle. What about the, the, the teaching of English in, in those outer circle contexts? Now, in terms of the goals and um, standards for English language teaching, right? How are outer circle uh, Englishes treated in relation to inner circle Englishes? Um, until fairly recently, um, the standard variety of inner circle countries um, are regarded right, as the only legitimate models for teaching and assessment, even for the outer circle uh, English speakers. But this is changing, right? This is changing now uh, because outer circle varieties are increasingly treated as equal and comparable to inner circle varieties. The Oxford um, English Dictionary, for example, has recently added several words, okay, from Singapore colloquial English, from Singlish, okay? So most of these words, as you can see here, are loan words from the local languages, right? Such as um, Malay or Chinese, right? So, you know, those are the expressions that are used only in Singapore and they have been recognized, okay, and added to the Oxford English Dictionary as you can see here. Um, so if, if we consider, right, outer circle varieties, um, such as Malaysian English, Singapore English, they're actually recognizable, right? They, 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 they are recognizable and they are well-established varieties, which inform communication in everyday life in local communities. And they have become part of the local people's national identity, as we have just now seen uh, in the video, right, about the Singaporean accent. Um, in some context, um, the former register okay, of the local English variety is also recommended to be used for teaching and assessing students' English language competence. Okay, so like in Singapore, for example, um, the standards for teaching English and assessing learners' English, um, you know, students' English uh, language competence is the standard Singapore English rather than, you know, any uh, inner circle um, Singapore English, uh, sorry, any inner circle English variety. Um, so, so in so the Ministry of Education English language syllabus, right, in Singapore, for example, emphasizes that the model for English language teaching should be an internationally acceptable variety that is grammatical, intelligible, fluent, and appropriate for purpose, for audience, for context, and culture. So there's no mention of, you know, must be a British English or American English, right? It is um, a, a model that is internationally intelligible, okay, and grammatical. Okay, um, so yeah, so that's about the outer circle. What about English in the expanding circle, like Indonesia or Vietnam or China or Thailand or some countries in Europe, right? Um, now, it has been recently estimated that um, there are about 1.5 billion English learners in the expanding circle, okay? A number that we can say vastly exceeds the population of English speakers in the inner as well as outer circle. Um, and in the expanding circle, um, although English has been mainly used for international communication, for example, uh, communication uh, means between Indonesian and foreigners, right, in Indonesia. 
but we have seen an increased use of English for intranational functionalities, such as media, uh, business, uh, education, okay, in many, many countries in the expanding circle. Now, if I think you can recognize this, um, this newspaper, right? The Jakarta Post, right? This is the English uh, language newspaper in Indonesia. And I'm sure that the readers, okay, are not only international, um, you know, uh, experts, right? Or foreigners residing in Indonesia, but also English uh, speaking Indonesians as well, right? And if you look at this picture here, this shows um, uh, an example of how English is used uh, in the context of, um, you know, like, prof like professional context. So English is used at a conference, okay? So it's a, like a means of communication between Vietnamese, okay, in the professional context. Um, so that is to say, expanding circle countries are becoming more like those in the outer circle, uh, where English is increasingly, um, you know, serving important functions uh, within borders. Okay, all right, so in this process, okay, uh, new localized features, okay, uh, may, may emerge, okay, as we have seen increasingly more research on Asian Englishes, um, such as Chinese English, Saudi English, Korean English, for example. And some scholars have even predicted that because of the rapid increase in the number of English users and the growing status of the um, growing status of English, right, and the expanding function of English in those in those countries, um, this may may mean an end to the English as a foreign language, right, um, status in those countries. Okay, right, and um, in recent years, okay, another kind of uh, English medium communication has become increasingly common. Right, and that is intercultural communication among non-native speakers uh, from diverse ethnic and cultural backgrounds. Okay, and the terms English as a lingua franca is used to describe this kind of communication. So English as a lingua franca communication means communication among L2 speakers of English. Okay, so like for example, um, uh, uh, you know, during the Asian summit, for example, okay, now um, the leaders, okay, of different Asian countries, right, who speak English as a second language, meet together and communicate using English, right? So in this context, this context is referred to as English as a lingua franca communication. Um, and also think about the fact that um, only one out of every four users of English in the world nowadays is a native speaker of the language, right? So that means there are more non-native speakers of English than native speakers of English. So that means that, okay, intercultural communication in the world today, okay, happen more often among second language speakers of English rather than between a non-native speaker of English and a native speaker of English. Okay, so one, one question is, when what happened when those L2 speakers of English meet and communicate? Okay, what kind of which varieties do they use? Okay, which which norms do they do they use? Do they adopt when communicate with one another? Okay. Um any any good guess over there? So for example, um now our communication can be considered English as a lingua franca communication, right? Between a Vietnamese you know, lecturer and Indonesian uh, students, for example, right? So what, what what kind of variety, What what which varieties of English are we using here? Is it in British English? Is it American English? Is it, you know, which varieties? <laughs> and what kind of norms do we use in order to communicate with one another? Okay, now, research has shown that um, speakers of English as a lingua franca, right? When they meet... When they communicate, they do not always make use of native speakers' norms. They don't. So I'm speaking Vietnamese English. You are using Indonesian English. We both draw on our own, you know, plural, plural uh, linguistic repertoires, right, or, or resources in order to establish mutual understanding. Okay. Um, yes. So, but. Many of them, okay, although they speak different varieties of English, uh, they draw on different norms of communication, 
they still manage to successfully interact with one another okay, by adopting good communication strategies to negotiate meaning. Now, if you recall what I said in the last lecture about strategic competence, okay, this is what, what I mean here, right? So they draw on um, a, a, a well-developed right, level of strategic competence in order to negotiate meaning and achieve mutual understanding. And this is especially true for high proficiency speakers. Now, if you if we have if if you take a look at this conversation here between a German and a Chinese, um, then you understand what I mean by good communication strategies. Okay, so in line one, uh, the German speakers say, "By the way, may I ask you for uh, what's your first language in China? Because we need it for this survey, right? So, you know, we understand that." a German is approaching a Chinese and then ask about his first language, right? To fill out a survey. Um, and in line two, the Chinese speaker signal non-understanding. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so, um, so at this point in line three, right? The German repeats his question, in, but in a shorter manner, right? So he only repeats the key point. Okay, so what is your first language? Okay, he doesn't repeat the whole long sentence anymore. Okay, he only repeat the key points. What is your first language? Um, and then in line four, okay, the Chinese repeats the key phrase, the first language, okay, um, which may signal non-understanding of the term or maybe just a confirmation of the, of the, of the question before he answers the question, right? So in line five, Okay, the German, okay, confirm the, the, the information, yeah, and rephrase it in another way, okay, to help the Chinese speaker to understand what he means, okay, yeah, your mother tongue, okay, your mother tongue, right, so first language means your mother tongue. So you can see what happened here is when a speaker signals non-understanding, right, the other speaker, okay, used accommodation strategy in order to you know help the, in order to help their conversational partner right to understand what they mean right so this is what happened when um speakers of english as a lingua franca meet and 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 negotiate meaning okay this often happens because of the gaps in their knowledge of english all right um and and they just communicate successfully right okay um, all right, so um, in terms of the, so, so, so what we can see here is um, what is important, okay, for English as a lingua franca communication is not, is not uh, adoption of uh, the native speaker's norm, but intelligibility, okay, so how to speak intelligibly, meaning how to make yourself understood, right? Um, and using uh, accommodation and communication strategies in order to facilitate, okay, understanding. Okay. And in terms of, oops, let's just move this one here. Um, in terms of intelligibility, right, um, researchers such as Jenkins, for example, um, have studied interaction among speakers of English as a lingua franca, and she found that not all non-native phonological features lead to communication breakdown, okay? Uh, meaning not all differences, okay? Uh, in terms of sounds, pronunciation may lead to misunderstanding, right? Um, so on the other hand, there are some, so, so for example, differences in um, those sounds right for example differences in pronouncing th and the like th, these are uh, like uh th like um this right and the like in mother okay or that l right what stress okay vowel quality rhythm or direction of pitch movements okay so raising voice or you know um using uh raising or falling intonation for example so differences in 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 those features those phonological features do not do not break down communication do not lead to misunderstanding um but okay um there are some features that must be articulated um as precisely and 
properly as possible in order to achieve mutual intelligibility. And Jenkins called these features lingua franca core features. Okay, and the lingua franca core features include most consonants except the fricative th and the, as we have just now talked about, initial consonant clusters, right? Uh, vowel length contrast. Okay, so um, uh, nuclear stress, for example. Okay, so um, what we have learned so far, right, until now is that um, the global spread of English uh, as an international language, right, or, or lingua franca means that our students may encounter a broad spectrum of English users. Okay, they may need to communicate with not only native speakers, but also non native speakers like themselves, right? Um, and uh, so, in this context, it is important that we do not teach only native speaker varieties. Okay, but we also need to help our learners to become aware of the different varieties, the, the diverse ways in which English is used around the world. Okay, to enable them to develop effective communicative uh, strategies for negotiating meaning, right, in communication in intercultural settings. Okay, so in other words, okay, the task for us now is not only teaching, um, you know, inner circle varieties, but also, you know, helping, we need to help our students to understand other L2 speakers like themselves as well. Okay, so how would you, for example, how would you make yourself understood when you communicate with someone from an expanding circle country like yourself or from an outer circle you know, country, okay? So how do you make yourself understood not only to native speaker of English, okay, from the UK, the USA, New Zealand, Canada, Australia, but also to speakers from Singapore, to speakers from China, for example, right? Okay, so um, I think we, will, um, we can have a... I was just, oops, sorry. We can have a little discussion here, and then um, we and then we we talk about um, whoops, sorry. Yeah. Okay. So um, so yeah. So we have a we we can pause to have a little of discussion here, um, and then Q and A and sharing thoughts and comments before we have a break and move on to another part. Okay, so based on your understanding of the users and users of English in today's globalized world, what are some takeaway points for you as a teacher of English as a second language in this context? And what are the implications for teachers in terms of the selection of instructional materials and designing of learning activities? All right. And any any question, any comments on that? Any thoughts? If if you don't want to speak, you may want to uh, put down your questions or thoughts in the chat box. Anyone? Okay, so no, no questions, no thoughts, no comments. Okay, it's, it's, this this can be a question. I mean, like a a, a takeaway point for you, right? Um, to think further at home. Okay, now before we have a break, um. Can I share with you a video, okay, a, a mini lecture from Professor uh, Jack Richards, okay, about the teaching of English as an international language, and and this video can help answer the questions that I put down here on the on the on the slide. All right, let's see. Okay. <laughs> oh, sorry.
Hello. Today I'd like to talk about the notion of English as an international language. It's a term you've probably heard, and it's a different way of thinking about the role of English in the world today. In the past, we used to think of English as being the property of the English-speaking countries. In other words, you spoke British English if you were in Britain, and American English if you were in North America, and so on. These days, however, English has become a world commodity. It belongs to anybody who wishes to learn it and use it. It doesn't belong to the traditional homeland countries where English is spoken. And for this reason, the term English as an international language is increasingly being used. Um, when we talk of English as an international language, we might be thinking of English as is spoken by Germans speaking to French speaking people, by Chinese businessmen speaking to Japanese uh, counterparts, by Brazilians speaking to Mexicans and so on. In other words, the, the parties involved may both be learners of English as a second language or users of English as a second language. And so uh, when English is thought about in these contexts, it's not so important that we imagine that we're learning English in order to understand and identify with the culture of the United States or the culture of Britain or the culture of Australia or whatever. In other words, English has become more of a neutral commodity, detached, if you like, from its historical um, homeland, if you like, and become something that anybody can use according to their needs and circumstances. Uh, many people, I think, uh, these days feel also when they're learning English that they don't necessarily need to master English as it's spoken by an American or an Australian or a Brit. Because the way you use a language, the way you speak a language, reflects your cultural identity. And so you may be quite comfortable speaking English with a Japanese accent or a Mexican accent or a French accent because, after all, that helps uh, identify who you are. It's not everybody, of course, who, uh, who will adopt this attitude. Some people may want to speak English in a way which is uh, very close to that spoken by native speakers, but that's a question of personal choice. So when we think of English as an international language, we're thinking about the, the way English has spread around the world, the fact that it's become an international commodity, if you like, used by different people in different ways according to their own needs and circumstances. And this raises implications for teaching. We want our students to hear these different varieties of English, to be comfortable using English um, as, they, as they do with the kind of fluency that they feel comfortable with and not to feel that they uh, have failed to learn English simply because they use English with a local pronunciation and some features that may be transferred from their mother tongue. Um, so in teaching then, we need to be careful in terms of uh, our attitudes towards the kind of English our students hear and the kind of English our students produce. Let's be more flexible, let's be more tolerant, um, let's uh, acknowledge the fact that English is an international language and can be used by different people according to the circumstances and the purposes for which they need it. All right, so we think more about the implication of this for materials design and development, right? In the in the second part of the lecture, um, I think let, let's let's just have a, a short break, uh, maybe a five minutes break, so that you can stand up and stretch yourself, and then come back at um, you know after five minutes, right? So is is it like two p.m. now um, in Indonesia, right? So come back at two five, right? Thank you. Okay.
one is back. Can, can you just give me a, a thumb up if everyone is back so we can um, resume our lecture? So everyone is okay? Can can we resume the, the lecture? Okay, so sorry. All right, so what we learned from the video, right? From from the from the from the lecture so far, right? And from Professor uh, Professor Jack Richard's lecture, right? Mini lecture is that um we need to teach not only one variety, but different like variations right in the way that english is used okay so um in other words um whoops in other words um proficiency right in uh in communicating with inner circle community is not is not enough right for outer circle and expanding circle communities okay because much of the communication in english happens among multilingual speakers in non-native and non-native interaction as we have mentioned before right um so and also when speakers in the outer and expanding circle speak to each other they are able to negotiate their differences in their own terms and accomplish their communicative needs effectively without deferring to inner circle norms Okay, so what does that mean? Okay, that means that proficiency needs or proficiency requires more than the ability to understand native speakers' varieties, okay, or produce English in the way that is understood, right, or understandable, comprehensible, okay, to native speakers of English, okay. Proficiency means the ability to shuttle between different varieties of English and different speech communities, meaning you can you should be able to make yourself understood to anyone who speak english right in the conversation that you're having with them okay so um yeah so um that means um that means that um we need so in this sense the argument becomes irrelevant whether local standards or inner circle standards matter okay so it we need both and more that is the ability to negotiate the varieties in other outer and expanding circle communities as well. So what these quotes mean is we need to teach, okay, and prepare our students for communication in a world, in, in a context where, you know, they may encounter a variety, okay, of English users from all around the world. Okay, so we have to prepare them so that they can make themselves understood as well as understand okay anyone who speak english whether they are american australian canadian or indonesian vietnamese thai chinese you know hungarian speakers of english right okay i hope that makes sense um okay so what skills um and uh so what what, what skills right do learners of um English as an international language, right? Need to develop, right? Okay, so according to Kanagaraja, right, 2009, um, they need a broader range of skills and competences rather than, you know, just um, the ability to understand native speakers' varieties, okay? They need to develop an awareness of the ling lingua franca core, okay? The features that have ensure mutual uh, intelligibility across varieties, right? So we have we have just uh, now uh, talk about that, right? So let's just get back to that, right? So those ling lingua franca core features, right? So they need to be aware of those features because if they don't produce those features uh, precisely, right, accurately, then they may not be able to make themselves understood, right, to to other speakers of English. Okay. 
right? What else? Social linguistic sensitivity. That is an awareness of dialect differences and recognition of different norms for different contexts of communication. And then finally, negotiation skills, such as the use of code switching, okay, to move in and out of another person's language, use of speech accommodation to inch toward each other as we modify our differences, the use of interpersonal strategies, including repair, rephrasing, clarification, you know, those are called accommodation, right? Communication and accommodation strategies. Um, gesture as well, right? Or topic change in order to mutually support one another. And attitudinal resources, for example, patience, tolerance, humility. So prepare our students for the situation or for the fact that English as a lingua franca or English as an international language means there's a lot of uncertainty and unpredictability because, you know, we don't know who we are going to you know, speak with, right, or communicate with, and what kind of varieties they 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 bring with them. They, they speak what kind of norms, cultural values, and norms they bring with them to the communication. So there's a lot of uncertainty, messiness, unpredictability. So we need to develop patience, okay, and tolerance to what differences, okay, while learning how to negotiate those uh, variations. Okay, in order to build meaningful relationship with other people and achieve our communicative goals. All right. Okay. So if we think of the implication of this discussion for materials development, right? Then what should EIL materials look like? Okay. Now, um, here I'm using McKay's suggestions, right? McKay 2012 suggestions. Okay, so the first principle is English as an international language material should be relevant to the domains in which English is used in the particular learning context. So that means that the materials that you're going to use, right, for your student should reflect how English is being used in your local context, okay? And be relevant to your learners' communicative needs um, in this context. So think about, for example, Indonesian context. Um, so who do your learners need to use English in order to communicate, you know, who, who, do you, uh, who do your learners okay, communicate in English with? So think about those communicative needs, okay? And evaluate the materials that you design or you adopt from other sources, whether they you know, meet those uh, communicative needs, okay? Second principle, EIL material should include examples of the diversity of English varieties used today, okay? So using example from different English varieties, right? Not only serves to raise learners' awareness that English does not belong only to speakers of the inner circle, okay? Like Professor Jack Richard has just now pointed out, right? English is, nowadays is an international commodity. It belongs to everyone who uses it, who speaks it, right? It doesn't just belong to the native speaker, okay? So uh, when you use example from different English varieties, right? That help to raise your learner's awareness, okay? That English does not belong only to native speakers, but also, but to everyone. Okay, who speak it, and that also helps them, you know, help enhance their uh, receptive skills. Okay, so improving their ability to comprehend. Okay, different varieties of English. Okay, so um, yeah, uh, the next one, um, the third principle is EIL materials need to exemplify L two L two interactions, meaning. They need to include not only dialogues between native, speaker, native speakers and non-native speakers, but also dialogues and exchanges between speakers of English as a second language, right? So for example, your material should include not only, you know, examples of how Indonesian speakers communicate with speakers from inner circle countries like Australia, New Zealand, Canada, USA, the UK, but also dialogues between Indonesian and speakers of English from other Asian countries, okay, like Singaporean, Indonesian, Indonesian, Japanese, Indonesian, Vietnamese, for example, right? Uh, why is it? Because as we have said before, 
the majority of uh, English interaction today are among L2 speakers rather than among a non-native speaker and a native speaker, right? So including uh, examples of L2, L2 interactions can help learners see um, and learn the various strategies, okay, uh, by which speakers seek clarification. So when they don't understand each other, how can they seek clarification? If you don't understand what I'm saying, because I'm speaking too fast, you know, how can you slow me down and ask me to clarify my meaning, for example, right? Um, okay, so clarification and also established relationship, okay, when they may have gaps in their knowledge of English. Okay, the fourth principle is full recognition needs to be given to the other languages spoken by English speakers. Okay, this means that we need to recognize that um, our learners of English, okay, are not failed copies of native speakers. They, are, they, they, they you know, many of them, right, learn English in order to, um, you know, like they, they learn English for designated purposes. For example, they learn English in order to um, complete their school requirements or in order to study further, for example, undertake um, studies in an English speaking country or for business purposes, for professional purposes, occupational purposes, right? They don't necessarily learn English in order to sound like a native speaker, right? Um, so we need to recognize that second language learners of English are multilingual users, okay? And as multilingual users, they have rich linguistic repertoires to draw on, okay? And they usually use those you know, linguistic, um, plural linguistic resources in order to signal their personal identity. So, you know, like code switching is, is one of the ways that um, help them to do that, right? So when you code switch, for example, okay, that helps to signal that you are a bilingual speaker, right? And you can function in two different languages. Okay, so um, yeah, and the uh, implication is, um, in code switching is uh, should not be banned, right? In 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 the classroom or in teaching materials, okay. Um, and the final principle is, um, EIL materials, okay, should be taught in a way, or EIL should be taught in a way that respects the local culture of learning, okay. And in this regard, local teachers like yourself, okay, are more suitable to design materials. Why is it? Okay, because they are familiar, right? Local teachers are familiar with local expectations regarding the roles of teachers and learners. And local teachers are also familiar with the manner in which English is used in the local context. Okay, so in Vietnam a while ago, right, there was a very hot debate on social media uh, regarding whether, whether we should adopt English language teaching materials from, from the outside, like from you know, um, um, English speaking countries, okay? So, you know, like buy commercially available materials from um, international uh, publishers, for example, or should we design our own materials, okay? Um, so if we think about the principle of EIL materials development discussed by McKay, you know, here, then definitely locally made materials are more suitable, okay? Because, um, only local teachers, only local authors understand their context, okay, and understand the um, the, the cultural expectations, okay, um, regarding you know like the local culture of learning, the expectation regarding you know learnings, okay, what learning what learning involves and how learning should take place. For example, all right. So I hope that makes sense. Um, I'm going to stop here a little bit for questions before I move on to the next part. So any questions, any thoughts, any, any comments to share? All right, no questions, no comments. All right, so yeah, so remember, okay, um, the principles here, because we are going to look at um, different set of textbooks to see, you know, to what extent they actually meet those criteria, okay? So, let me move on to the next part, which is 
learning EIL from English language textbooks, how likely? All right, so I'm going to present some example from my own research and research that I know of. Um, okay, so um, let's start with um, uh, my, uh, okay, let's start with um, my paper, go also with my student, right? Uh, in 2020, uh, we look at high school textbooks used in Vietnam, so especially if we look at English uh, 10 to 12, meaning English books for year 10 and year 12 students, right? Year 10 to year 12 students. So three, three series, right? English 10, English 11, and English 12. Um, and those books are written by local authors, right? In collaboration with Pearson Education. Okay, so we look at the... Um, intercultural orientations uh, of, of, of the books. Okay, so to what extent the books, okay, um, prepare students for communication in English as an international language. And what we found is, okay, there is an equal representation of cultural contents in those books, okay? 36% of the content was related to Western and Anglophone context, 27% uh, were related to local context, but other Asian contexts are seriously underrepresented. Okay, so this is um, a very unfortunate situation because if we think about the, um, you know, if you think about the the, the fact that um, Vietnam is situated within Southeast Asia, right, and um, you know Vietnamese people tend to speak, I mean, tend to communicate, right, in English with. Asian speakers of English, other Asian speakers of English, right? You know, people from, from the region rather than native speakers. So this is a really unfortunate situation that the textbook doesn't include enough cultural content from other Asian contexts in order to prepare students, okay, to communicate with other Asian speakers of English, all right? And we also found that Western cultural values were openly valorized, Okay, why local values were rarely, you know, were, uh, were, were, were rarely portrayed um, and, and or, or if they were portrayed, then they were portrayed in a less positive light. So I'm going to give you some example of what I mean, right? So if you look at this uh, reading text, okay, from English 11, all right? So I let you, I give you a few minutes to just look at the two texts and then I'm going to analyze it. And I hope that you can avoid this mistake when you write your own materials, okay? Done, all right? Or do you need a bit more time? Okay, so, all right, if you think about, you know, like, I mean, on the surface, the two texts look kind of innocent, right? So, you know, the first text discusses parenting practices in the USA, and the second one discusses parenting practices in Vietnam. So on the surface, there's no problem, but if you, you know, um, do an in-depth analysis, okay, of the ideologies uh, of the of the, you know, um, yeah, be behind ideologies behind the text, uh, then you can see there's some problems, all right? Because here, American parents, uh described as liberal and respectful of their children's autonomy, right? So for example, teaching them to live independently, showing respect to them, uh, letting them voice their own opinions, so on and so forth. Um, so in other words, uh, this is a parenting style that is generally um, deemed um, progressive, advanced, right? And endorsed in modern Western philosophy of education. But if you look at 
the Vietnamese, the way that the Vietnamese parenting practices are described. Okay, then they not they not depicted in a very positive light, right? Compared to American, compared to the description of American parenting practices, right? So Vietnamese parents are described as uh, protective and authoritarian, right? For example, they provide for, for their children, but they seldom ask for their children's uh, opinions. So you can see that here, the second text subtly portray the Vietnamese parenting values as inferior, okay? And less desirable as compared to the American um, parenting practices, okay? Um, yeah, so this is what I mean by valorizing um, Western values, various, you know, um, uh, portraying the local context, local, sorry, the local values as uh, undesirable. Okay, um, this is another reading text, okay, from English 10, Unit 7. Um, okay, and I also let you uh, read a bit, okay, before I analyze the text. Okay, done. Right. So you see that there's another text where the you know where the author contrasts okay the concept of success for the Americans versus the concept of success for the Vietnamese, um, and um, students are, are are asked to read and then answer the question. Right, it's three question. So the first question is what is the American idea of success? Question two, who can be considered a successful person in Vietnam? And question three, what are the similarities and differences between the ideas of success in the two countries? And you can see that there's a lot of overgeneralization here, all right? And why the American culture is positively uh, portrayed, right, as valuing self-made and self-driven individuals, right? So success for them is the result of hard work and self-reliance, for example. The Vietnamese culture is portrayed um, in a much less favorable light, as you can see, right? Because blessing, because they, 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 they are described as placing more value on superficial things, such as wealth, you know, social status, when defining success. But if you look at the, 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 the question, the comprehension question here, the, the, the task here, the discussion task here, right? Um, students are not invited to challenge those generalizations. Okay, and and so they're not invited to challenge, you know, the the stereotypes and offer an alternative perspective on the issue discussed here. And this is very dangerous, right? Because it actually, you know, promotes or reinforce the stereotypes, other than you know, um, celebrate the local values. Okay, and this is another example, and I, I think I have shown you, right, uh, previously, all right? So using a topic that is totally foreign, totally unfamiliar and uh, non-relatable, okay, to the local students, okay? And this is something that we want to avoid when we write our own materials. We want to choose a topic that our student can relate to, okay, because it is relevant to their, to their everyday life, their, to their cultural experiences, to their lived experiences. Okay, rather than you know a totally uh, un un uh, relatable or, or or you know um, a concept that they they can't uh, make sense of. Okay, all right. So um, this is another study um, that I also like to present here by Cybro and Rose in twenty. Uh, 18 and they look at German produced English textbooks. Okay, and they ask three questions. Okay, who are positioned as the owners of English? Okay, 
who are the target interlocutors in the materials and what models and norms of English are used in the books and the audio materials? Of course, there are more, more, more questions than that, but I want to focus on those three questions in the presentation. All right, so for question number one, okay, so who should be positioned as the owners of English? Now, if we recall Professor Jack Richards' mini lecture, right, then the owner of English should be both native and non-native speakers, okay, who use English, who speak English, right, uh, with emphasis on global use of English. Question number two, who are the target interlocutors in the materials? Now, if we recall the fact that nowadays, okay, our students need to communicate with people from all over the world, okay, not only native speakers, but also with other L2 speakers like themselves, then the target interlocutors in the materials, right, should be anyone who uses English, okay? That is both native speakers and non-native speakers, okay? Question number three, what models and norms of English are used in the books and the audio materials? Um, and if we recall what we have discussed, okay, regarding world Englishes, English as a lingua franca, English as an international language, um, then the models and the norms should be world Englishes. And English should be, you know, described as diverse and flexible and fluid, okay? So what about... The, so what about the material, okay, that they analyze, okay? So well, this is what they found. They found that, okay, the book positioned native speakers, okay, especially native speakers from inner circle, okay, countries such as the USA, the UK, you know, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, okay, as owners of English, okay? So describe native speaker as the only owners of English, a legitimate owner of English. Number two, they found that the target interlocutor described in the materials are native speaker of English. Okay, so what is the danger of doing that? Danger of doing that is you don't prepare your student adequately for communicating with other non-native speakers like themselves. Okay, so if they go out and, you know, like communicate with uh, a speaker from another uh, expanding circle country, okay, then how can, I mean, how can they make themselves understood to those people or understand those people, right? Okay, um, so what model and norms are of English are used in the book, okay? Inner circle natives English, not surprisingly, right? And English is described as standard and static, right? So no variation. Okay, between different varieties. Okay, so if textbooks, okay, overlook variations in English use, okay, and legitimize or, or bias in favor of native speakers and native speakerism, right, then they can't adequately prepare our students to communicate in English as a lingua franca or English as an international language context, right? It's very unfortunate, right? Um, okay, and this is uh, another study that um, I conducted with uh, Dr. Robbie Malina from RELC Singapore and my student Kung Kao. And we look at the same set of high school textbooks in Vietnam, English 10, 11, and 12. Um, and we look at three issues, okay? We explored how the books orient towards uh, English as an international language paradigm, um, and also the extent to which the books um, adequately engage learners in learning to use English across cultures. And we focus on um, the description of English users in the books, okay? So who are positioned as English language users? And to what extent uh, multicultural communication is portrayed? So we look at patterns of communication presented in the books. Uh, um, are they mostly L2, L1, L2, or are there any examples, okay, of L2, L2 interactions or not? Um, and we're looking at teaching, the teaching of communication and accommodation strategies for cross-cultural communication. For example, do the book teach students strategies for making themselves understood, or you know, uh, trying to clarifying meaning with, with the interlocutors. So strategies such as clarification request, confirmation check, uh, repair, code switching, and so on and so forth. And we're also looking at language ideologies and cultural 
ideology is promoted in the books as well. And this is what we found. Okay, so we found that 41% okay, of the exchanges in the receptive task were between Vietnamese speakers of English in a variety of social contexts. Okay, for example, school, home, and workplace, 27% were between Vietnamese and Western or Anglo American speakers, and only 2% were between Vietnamese and other Asian speakers of English. Okay, so these findings suggest that Western or Anglo-American speakers rather than other Asian speakers were considered the main interlocutors with whom Vietnamese students may communicate in intercultural context, which is not the case in real life communication because thinking about, you know, the geographical location of Vietnam, right? It is situated with, you know, in Southeast Asia, and it has a lot of collaboration partnerships, business partnerships, right? With other Asian countries in the region, right? Then chances are Vietnamese students may communicate with Asian speakers of English more often than with, you know, speakers of English from other region of the world, right? But the book, obviously doesn't prepare or don't prepare students very well for that purpose. We also found that 97% uh, of productive tasks require learners to communicate with other Vietnamese speakers of English. For example, there's a lot of group, group discussion um, tasks and some email writing where learners are uh, required to write or to communicate with another Vietnamese okay, interlocutor or, or, or audience. Only 1% of tasks require communication with Western Anglo-American speakers and zero task, no task require communication with other Asian speakers of English, which is very unfortunate, right? Now, the lack of focus on interaction with in international speakers of English suggests that the tasks here are designed mainly for the purpose of language practice, okay, without taking the EIL paradigm to, into full account. And we can say that this tendency is not, obviously is not desirable, right? In preparing students to use English in global context. And so there needs to be more balanced representation of English users and English users, right? Uh, from varied national, linguistic, cultural backgrounds, especially the neglect of Asian English speakers in the books can be very worrisome, right? As I said before, and, and may reinforce, okay, the misperception uh, <coughs> that international English users merely or only come from Anglophone countries or European countries, uh, which is not true. So this is something that when that I'd like you to to, to think of, you know, to consider when you design your own materials, okay? Think about, you know, the, the sources of materials that you want to use, the kind of, you know, um, uh, the interlocutors, target interlocutors that you want to, you know, uh, portray in the books, okay? So that you can prepare your student to communicate with not only native speakers and non-native speakers from Europe, but also non-native speaker from Asian, other Asian countries as well, okay? Think about that, okay? And uh, in relation to the portrayal of multicultural communication in the books, um, now previous research suggests that multilingual users of English uh, consciously build, their, build on their awareness that <clears throat> they deal with people from diverse linguistic and cultural backgrounds. <clears throat> and so they rely on uh, they rely a great deal on their strategic competence, right? Their, their strategic repertoires to support other speakers in communication and resolve communication breakdown when it arises. Um, but what we found is uh, in the book is there was very little room for students to explore and learn how to use accommodation strategies, okay, in the books. Because the books tended to present an idealized version of intercultural communication in which people from different backgrounds interact successfully often without misunderstanding and so they don't need to accommodate to one another so if you compare a dialogue in in the textbook here 
and uh, the dialogue between you know a German and a Chinese, right? And happening in the real life, you can see that there's a lot of differences. So if you look at the dialogue here, okay, my is a Vietnamese. Anna, I'm not sure where she come from, but it's a Western name, right? So Nam is another Vietnamese name. So Mai say, you know, so this conversation happens when the three people, Mai, Anna, and Nam are watching uh, the performance of a young pop star, right? So Mai say, the young pop star looks shy, right? And Anna immediately answer, yeah, he's the teen idol who is exciting female fans around the world. Then Nam said, he also looked passionate on stage. And Anna said, look can be receiving. Ha, ha, ha. I brought his uh, platinum album, my wall, a few years ago. So you can see that the communication is so smooth. No miscommunication. No need to, <clears throat> no non-understanding. No need to re repeat yourself or you know, confirm or rephrase, which is so different from the real life communication when you know there can be... Um, interruption there can be there can be misunderstanding you know and then you need to learn how to you know uh, resolve all these problems all right so um with this kind of you know materials it is questionable whether they can adequately support <clears throat> students in expanding their strategic um, repertoires for successful negotiation okay uh, across variational uh, interaction. <clears throat> and then finally, we look at linguistic model. Okay. And we found that there's a strong preference for British English. All right. So the spelling, the pronunciation, the words, the accent of the recordings, right, of the characters in the recordings, they all are British English, right? But other English models, especially those in the periphery, for example, Singapore English, were, were overlooked, were neglected, were not used. <clears throat> and uh, we also look at um, whether native speakerism is advocated in the, in the textbooks, right? So native speakerism means um, the belief that uh, native speakers, teachers are the best models Okay, and best language teachers, they're better than native speakers, all right? And we found that native speakerism is prevalent, okay, in the books, meaning English native speakers are portrayed as the legitimate owners or the models of the English language and ideal teachers. Okay, so in a reading text, uh, this one, okay, so in a reading text discussing digital uh, digital tools to improve, um, you know, uh, improve uh, English language learning, right? Students are advised to make use of a software tool in order to improve their pronunciation with the help of different native English speakers, right? So if you read this, okay, the text say there is software that can help improve your pronunciation. You can choose to practice with different native English speakers, right? So this implies the prestige of native speakers models or varieties, right? Over non-native speakers varieties. Um, right, so in another text, right, depicting a language course advertisement, if you look, take a look at here, okay? Native speakers are associated with well-qualified teachers. Okay, apparently mainly on the basis of their speakerhood and Western origin. Okay, so again, if we think about the ideology, the language and the culture ideologies promoted in the books, then is bias against non-native speakers and in favor of native speakers, right? Okay. And if we recall, okay, what... Um, <clears throat> McKay has suggested regarding I, uh, EIL materials development, then obviously the books that I have just now presented don't meet those criteria, all right? Okay, so um, before I stop, I'm going to present 
um, two value evaluation checklist, all right, for you to apply, okay, when you design your own materials or evaluate, you know, uh, materials adopted from outside sources, all right. So the, um, the first, okay, ask yourself, right, first evaluation checklist, looking at, you know, so this is developed based on McKay 2012. Uh, so I ask a group of my um, students, right, my thesis student to, to develop it. And so this is what they suggested, okay? So do the materials include a wide variety of English users and context? Do they include examples that are relevant to local social context? Do they include example of the diversities of ways in which English is used across discourse communities and cultures? Give recognition to learners' language, cultural backgrounds, and respect the local culture and ways of learning. All right. So when you pick up a set of materials or design your own, your own materials, ask yourself those questions. Right. Okay. And the and those are the criteria um, proposed by Tomlinson. Right. Uh, Twenty nineteen. Okay. So you can use those additional criteria. Okay. In evaluating and designing your materials as well. To what extent are the materials likely to help the learners to understand English when it is spoken by non-native speakers of English, right? Understand English when it is written by non-native speakers of English, make themselves understood in speech to non-native speakers of English, make themselves understood in writing to non-native speakers of English, interact effectively with non-native speakers of English and achieve intangibility, intangibility with non-native speakers of English with a much higher or lower level of communicative competence. Seek appropriate clarification without losing face or giving offense. Accommodate the English towards speakers of different varieties of English. Be sensitive to cultural differences when interacting with non-native speakers of English. All right, so... Um, that's the end of my presentation. And um, I'm going to invite some thoughts, some comments, some questions. Okay. Um, and I have a question here for you as well and a, and, a, and a mini activity if we have time. Okay. So the question is, as an English language teacher, how can you ensure a balanced representation of global Englishes? Okay. Meaning not only representation of the English varieties from the inner circle, uh, but also from you know the outer circle, the expanding circle as well. So how do you ensure a balanced representation of global Englishes in the materials that you develop and use in order to raise learners' awareness of the diversity of global English users and prepare them to communicate across cultural boundaries? So that's a question for you, all right? I would appreciate it if you could um oops sorry if you could share your thoughts um either by speaking or typing in the chat here. Sorry. I just don't know where it, yeah. yeah, here it is. Any comments, any thoughts about that or questions? No questions, no comment, no thought to share. Jadi ada pertanyaan, hello ladies and gentlemen, is there any question for Dr. Muyan? Sorry, mean that I have to, what is that, to discuss it, to join it a little bit uh, late for the session. Oh, it's okay, no no worries, I understand. <laughs> yeah. When we talk, about, okay, can I have some kind of thought about it? Maybe when you ask yeah, yeah, about sure. the... Um, Harry, be, be, before that, can I check with you, did I send you the slides of the previous lecture? Yes, we have. Oh, we, we have I did. I have already. I did. Okay, but not okay. for today. But not for today. 
Yeah, yeah. I'm going to send this after after yeah, today. No no yes. Okay. Regarding to the how do you say global English, I mean the word English, we have a lot of uh, English is based on our what is that? Our specific tribe or something like Japanese, Kalimantanis, and then Sumatanis. Yeah. And then one of our lecturer, they have what is that? They in our study program we have the pronunciation classes, right? in our study program and then the pronunciation itself they talk about the dialect they talk about the phonetic and so and etc blah 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 and then because a lot of students here what is that uh they are come from japanese a lot of students from japanese so basically when they, they speak in english mostly they are doing like it's difficult for them for us for even for me to speak like american english or maybe English. That's you need right. that. You need to speak like an American. I mean, my whole yeah. lecture is about <laughs> not needing to sound like an American, right? Or British. <laughs> yeah. So right? I mean, so, yeah. I mean, uh, one of our lecturers use what is that? Finally, they use they she do the research and then they, they talk about the research talk about Japanese English, Java, Japanese English, right? Uh, yeah, so the pronunciation itself, they do not focusing on American or British, but they use pronunciation for the Japanese English. So what do you think about it? Is it okay for what is that? For speaking activity or reading, not yeah, mostly speaking, right? Speaking activity in the uh, in the material or something like that. If they can use the some specific uh, tribe based. Uh, dialect or something like that. What English you can say? So, 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 just go back to my previous slide, right? So, I mean, in order to develop, you know, I mean, if if you think about, you know, proficiency, um, you know, intelligibility, right? We we don't need to we don't need to sound like an American or like yes. uh, British, right? Because yes. accent is about identity. It's about personal choice, and sometimes it's about you know, like your your the influence of your first language as well. It's really difficult for someone, I mean, I mean for an adult learner to pick up the native speaker's accent. It's impossible. Um, so yeah, and it it, it it's not needed for, for comprehension in intercultural communication. Now in order for people to understand you, okay, and and you know, in order for you not to cause any misunderstanding or communication breakdown, you need to focus on you know, developing accurate pronunciation of those lingual franca core features. Okay, so most consonant, except for, you know, the and the, so the, mother, okay? Initial consonant cluster, okay? So spring, not spring, for example, spring. Power land contrast, okay? So for example, okay? Nuclear stress, okay? And differences in other, in other features do not, do not contribute to communication breakdown. So you don't need to worry about that. And if we think about proficiency, okay? So proficiency means the ability to shuttle between different varieties of English, rather than the ability to comprehend, you know, native speakers English, or to speak English in a way that is only understandable to native speakers English, right? So if we think about all this, then the answer to your question is yes, why not? <laughs> We should do, we should we should do that actually right yes is that is that all <laughs> yeah sure because yeah since I, when I was uh, what is that in bachelor degree it's all about American British American British Australian uh, accent or something like that we never talk about what English is before so that's why I mean this kind of what's English is, is quite how do I say kind of a breakthrough in order to be to be delivered to be to be introduced for in teaching and learning process in our formal institution like this so maybe this the thing that maybe yeah is a kind of challenging process for introducing and also to applying for the for the students to to talk about using well, this kind of it's time, it's time to it's time to introduce the student okay it's sure. time to, to encourage students and even teachers mm -hmm. Okay, sure. to think about, yeah, I mean, <laughs> accent is, is identity, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, I teach in a native speaking country and all of my mm -hmm. students, if not, I mean, most of my students, if not all, are native speakers. Yeah, because actually there are so many videos out there like TikTok and YouTube. There are many Indians 
English and the yeah. Chinese yeah. English. They are so proud of them. They are so proud and of what so, they have. So, in the, the so usually during my first session, my first lecture, I will always tell them. Now, this is this is the first lecture that I usually you know teach okay so introduce them to the world of Englishes and I always mm -hmm. tell them that I am a Vietnamese born and raised in Vietnam I speak English with a Vietnamese accent and that is that's that's how I I mean who I am right mm -hmm. so um, let's let's do negotiation of meaning if you don't understand meaning tell me okay so we can negotiate mm -hmm. and because later on they need to go to you know expanding circle countries to teach English they need to understand non-native speakers right mm -hmm. otherwise teach them right <laughs> so, yes yeah. you're right yeah so it's not only the the, the issue of us understanding native speakers but mm -hmm. also they have to learn how to understand us as well right sure. two way communication is two way yeah mm -hmm. okay. so thank you thank you by the way for the yeah. comments um thank, thank you so much i don't think that we have time for the activity sure. but i'm going to send you the um the, the the materials and mm -hmm. uh, maybe think about that, that that's that's the okay. so this is um uh, a commercialized kind of uh, uh, go, go back Oh, is it kind of example of something in the textbook um, that you showed yeah, me? Yeah, that's that's a material, uh, a piece of materials that um, sorry, that's a commercial textbooks that I would like oh? from um written by a sorry, okay written by native speakers. So I should, how can I copy the link? Okay. Gosh, how can I share the link? Hmm, maybe you can share to me directly with the PDF something if it's difficult for yeah, you to get yeah. the link. Oh, here it is. Share. I'll, I'll just send it through chat. So um, if you open this one, this is, this is what we call um, mm -hmm. commercially available materials, right? And if you use all these criteria, think about those criteria, and you can see immediately whether the materials are suitable to your student and suitable to teaching English as an international language. Okay? And, and you might have to adapt, you know, like certain parts of it, right? For example, if you want to teach, you want to use that textbook for Indonesian students, right? Uh, you need to introduce more local local text, mm. um, yeah. events and places and people and cultural norms as well. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I think that's about it, right? It's about two minutes left. Any other questions or comments before? Yes. The day? <laughs> sure. Sorry, somebody talked to me, so I need to it's concentrate. <laughs> Okay. So, are there any question for Dr. Nguyen before we? This is our last session for the visiting lecture yeah. from Dr. Nguyen. So, hopefully, when you have any kind of common insight or want to say something to Dr. Nguyen, that will be the great time for you to deliver it now. I really hope that you know, the evaluation checklist here are helpful yeah. when you design your own materials or when you adapt mm. other sources. You know, um, so remember, you know, rep equal representation, okay? diversity, mm -hmm. English users and context, right? Yes. Uh, include L two L two interactions, very important. Okay, yeah. local cultures, emphasis on local cultures, local values and norms, very important because your students learn English in order to express their identity. Okay, yes. they are Indonesian speakers of English, right? Mm. They don't learn English to become native speakers. They use English to talk about themselves, about their experiences, to share about their country, their culture, yes. like the world. So, yes, yeah, so yes. it's very important to emphasize the local cultures, sure. norms, events, and sure. places. Yeah. Yes, in, in my in my class of Madev, usually I, I give the theory for my students when we are creating the material development uh, yep. based on like the research from Cortesi or something. Usually we use three types of culture that we have to put the inside of our the material here. It's from the called local culture and yep. then for English culture and also international culture. Those three cultures should be included in the yes. in the material yeah. that we yeah. develop for for the students in junior high school or senior high school. Right, that's great. And I hope that you don't you don't 
make them you can avoid the mistake <laughs> that is found in Vietnamese oh. language textbook, Vietnamese English language textbook, for example. You can see ah, that okay. kind of focus on Western context, but very little emphasis on Asian context and other Asian oh, countries. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, so I, if you think about Indonesia, you know, it's, I think it's quite similar to Vietnam, right? You are yes, of course. Asia, you communicate with people from from the, the region, right? Mm. Other than people from Europe, right? I mean, sure. Like, so, so there should be uh, enough emphasis or adequate emphasis mm -hmm. on Asian context, right? Sure. You know how to communicate with speakers, you know, from other Asian countries. Okay. Mm. Yeah. And especially if you think about, you know, when you compare and contrasting culture, okay, think about how you should present your, your local culture and avoid mistake like this. When you valorize, you know, you value the American culture, but you devalue your own culture now, which is, which is unfortunate, right? Sure. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so I think if uh, there's no more question or thoughts to share, Maybe uh, uh, I think it's it's okay for us to what is that to end the session then since it's already praying time also here. I heard yeah. already from the mass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so thank you praying. very much. Yeah. And I'm yeah. going to share with you the slides later on. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Nguyen, for having the session for the last three sessions, of course, not only for today, but for the last two, uh, last two weeks last week and also this week and hopefully from what you have already delivered it's going to be the new insight and also for the new knowledge for our students especially not only for my students actually but also for me as the lecturer of English mental development uh, of course in order to improve the quality of the teaching learning process here in our department English education Universitas Muhammadiyah Surakarta once more uh, in, in regard from our department I would like to say thank you so much for Dr. Nguyen, for you, Min, for having this session. Hopefully, we can still continue our this collaboration for the next uh, for the next future collaboration. Right. Not only for just so much, Mr. Uh, yes, yeah. for this visiting professor, but also if possible, maybe we can sh share another collaboration, like maybe visiting or maybe research or something like that. That would be great. Yeah. yeah, sure, sure. Thank you for the opportunity, right, to speak to yes. your students as well. I mean, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I hope that yes. the lectures are useful for everyone. Sure, yeah. definitely. Yeah. And of course, after this, maybe I will contact you regarding the administrative things Thank about you. this. And rather on, we are going to discuss it more about what you have discussed to me about uh, the possible collaboration, like between, uh, what is that, uh, student exchange or something like what you discussed. Maybe yeah. later on, we are going, we can have another discussion about that. Right. Sure, 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 sure. Just, just um, you know, email me or drop me a, a message, and then we can. Sure, I will. Yeah. Sure, I will. And once more, thank you so much. Thank and you. Before we go, wait a minute, wait a minute. Can oh. we just share the screen and then take a picture together? Oh, okay. <laughs> that will be great for the our. I can okay, the other can everybody can open the camera, please. Before Dr. Nguyen leave the Zoom, yeah. Okay, yang sudah buka semuanya silakan. Kameranya dibuka ya, adik-adik. Ya, ya semuanya silakan di on cam. Mbak Revi, Safina, Bulan Kumaharani, Sahiva, Anisa, Fitriana Putri, and everybody turn on the camera. Okay, later on in my class, I would like to discuss you more about the material that have been shared by Dr. Nguyen here today. Okay. Okay, let me count on the three, right? Wait a minute. One, two, three, smile. Wait a minute. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very uh, much. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Bye. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> Oke, okay, terima kasih adik-adik. Uh, oh ya, yeah. selanjutnya sebelum saya tutup ya, ini ada informasi untuk yang Pak Willy yang untuk mata keluar TEFL untuk kuliah tamunya untuk kita akan diundur ya minggu depan karena hari ini misalnya lagi sedang apa namanya sedang ada akreditasi macam-macam jadi agak susah untuk mengkondak. Jadi sampai ketemu lagi minggu depan untuk mata kuliah TEFL yang nanti Insya Allah akan difasilitasi oleh 
Dr. Willy Renandia dari Nanyang University Singapura. Jadi tetap join ya. Thank you semuanya di Ade. Assalamualaikum. Nanti setelah ini akan saya share untuk apa namanya presensinya. Sudah ya. Mari kita dengan membaca. Alhamdulillah bersama-sama. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Terima kasih. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.